our speaker today. Just a quick reminder, you have uh, one week to get your assignment done. They're all, they're all due uh, in class next week, so everyone should uh, submit a hard copy of your reflection uh, essay at the beginning of class next week, for those of you that have signed up for LDA 190, obviously. And also there's a Dropbox uh, where you'll sort of upload the electronic version of this as well. Okay, so just a quick reminder. There were some questions about the project. Um, and I just want to reiterate that the intervention that you're making is a change in the environment, a change in your everyday environment or the everyday environment of others to improve it, the, the condition for, uh, for different users. So it's really not necessarily a large project. Um, it's not necessarily a service type project where you're just volunteering to do something. Uh, given that most of, are, most, most of you are studying design, it's about a design intervention at, at whatever scale. So uh, if you have other questions about that, I can answer them after uh, class. So today's speaker is a uh, transdisciplinary practitioner in the, in the truest sense. Uh, Fernando Marti is a, a Bay Area artist, uh, architect, design builder, did I miss anything? <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> um, and has, has worked in a, a number of different venues. But his work in architecture, uh, uh, community planning, and community design uh, includes both urban at the scale of urban design as well as uh, self-built projects. That includes community garden structures to public plazas, uh, et cetera. Currently, he works for uh, Asian Neighborhood uh, Design in their community pl planning program where he and others provide assistance to NGOs and organizations around land use issues, zoning, affordable housing, and other types of uh, planning and design services. He's also actively involved with the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition, uh, which is a, an advocacy group looking at uh, community-based planning uh, in the, the Mission District especially in light of pressures of, of displacement uh, associated with gentrification and redevelopment. Uh, as an artist, uh, much of his work focuses on uh, claiming identity and, and, and investigating place uh, through different themes of uh, memory, time, um, as they pertain to local histories of resistance. He's also pretty involved uh, in, in that role. T uh, as an artist, he teaches political poster making uh, with the San Francisco Print Collective and is a member of the Just Seeds Visual Resistance Artists Cooperative. Fernando holds master's degrees in planning and architecture from UC Berkeley and was a, uh, is a past recipient of the Rose Architectural Fellowship. Currently, he serves on the board of Poder which is, stands for People Organizing to Demand Environmental and Economic Rights, as well as uh, uh, his involvement with the collective, the uh, Center for Political Education. So please join me in welcoming Fernando Marti. Thank you. Is this, is this good for volume? Good. Um, so I entitled this talk with kind of a highfalutin liberatory urbanism. Um, with a question mark because I'm, as, as Michael said, I'm doing a whole lot of different things and I'm not entirely sure exactly how to tie them all together, but they seem to make sense in, in my head somehow. Um, there's not sort of a, a central uh, theory to it, but I, I wanted to start, the t slideshow is going to be mostly images, but I wanted to start with some questions. Um, and maybe, didn't know the the setting was going to be this large. I was hoping to get a little response from folks, but maybe I'll just leave it as, as the questions. Um, let me just get a sense. Are most of you, who, who all are uh, freshmen and sophomores here? OK. And who are kind of upper division students? OK. And grad students? No grad students. OK. So, just to get a sense of kind of where I work in, uh, most of the slides you're going to see, except for a few, are in San Francisco. Um, the site is the city, basically. And 
the city as a place where you look at almost any city and you can see the city as the place where um, oppression in terms of class and race has its probably its most salient face. Any city is segregated by race. It is the place where um, people come to find jobs, many of them not very good jobs. Um, but it is also a place of liberation. Um, when the cities were beginning to be formed in their contemporary form um, in the 1700s at the beginnings of capitalism, um, it was a place where people were not only forced to go because their livelihoods on the countryside were being destroyed, but it was also a place where people could go to find liberation, to meet other people, to create culture. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a central thing of, of what I'll be showing today. I think one of the questions that I ask myself and, and that I'm trying to address with this work is what is the role of someone who is socially conscious in terms of the struggles that people undergo in everyday life? What is the role of a conscious artist? What is the role of a, of a conscious architect? What is the role of a conscious city planner? Um, and I guess what is the role of, of a parent? That's my three-week-old and my wife who just came in, um, and we're trying to figure that out um, ourselves. Um, and part of those, those answers come from thinking about who we choose to work with um, and thinking about deeply what is our relationship as professionals, as someone who comes out of uh, a university education with a degree, say, in landscape architecture and city planning, what is our role then when there are all these struggles happening in the landscape that we work in? Um, and how do we overcome the barriers that we bring with as being professionally educated people um, who have various types of privileges um, in regards to the uh, struggles that people have? Um, one of the things that we deal with is that, that a city is... And, and towns, in a contemporary sense, are mostly built in a top-down process. It's shaped by what finance capital wants to do, where finance capital wants to invest. Sometimes they invest in um, new home ownership opportunities like crazy, and then they screw up or screw over a lot of people. Um, or what the state wants to do, which could be, let's say, a university expanding. Um, or a redevelopment agency. But the use of the city is shaped by people's everyday experiences, by how we walk through the streets, by how we use stores and streets and parks and, and our own homes. Um, a couple of definitions, I, I use the word liberatory urbanism, um, this is something we kind of made up. Um, but the idea I had, and I don't know how, how many folks here are familiar with liberation theology or, or Paulo Freire's theories, but an idea that you can look at, say, religion or, say, um, education or theater as something that is received information, like I am sort of spouting lots of words out at you and you all are out there receiving stuff. Um, but there is education that is really co-created by the person who is speaking and you all in a conversation. Um, and it isn't necessarily how cities are built today. But in the history of cities, oftentimes you have, you know, if any of you are taking kind of history of, of Western civilization and cities, you know, there were the, the burgs in, in uh, uh, Western Europe uh, where, you know, there were centers of power and castles and, and cathedrals. And then they would build a wall around it. And almost as soon or before the wall was finished, there was a Faubourg, the, the false city that uh, people started to build, the slums. Um, it was people sort of congregating and building their own city. Um, and so there's this back and forth about that. And that was kind of what I was trying to get at in talking about a liberatory urbanism, which I'm not sure really exists, but so in question marks is kind of one of the things that many of us who are involved in community design in its various forms are trying to create. So I was going to start with some, some of the artwork that I'm involved in. Um, so this is, and if I kind of stole this idea of organizing this from um, 
uh, Peter Hall's uh, book on, on uh, history of city planning. So this is the city as one thing or another. So this is the city as it's written on the walls. And this is some work that I've done uh, with a group called the San Francisco Print Collective. Um, this is actually work that the San Francisco Print Collective was doing before I got involved with them, but it, it connects back to what I'll talk a little bit later about some planning work. Um, in the early 2000s um, in San Francisco, uh, there was a dot-com boom, this huge investment of money into uh, mul multimedia and, and computer technologies that affected the Silicon Valley, but, but uh, all the Bay Area. Um, and actually, I met Michael through some work um, that he got me involved in as a grad student, uh, working with a group called the Mission Housing um, Development Corporation in the Latino district of San Francisco, known as, as the Mission District. Um, and in the struggle against gentrification and displacement, a lot of people were being evicted, um, something that hasn't really stopped um, since then, despite sort of ups and downs of the economy. Um, but a group called um, the SF Print Collective was formed and really transformed the urban environment in that neighborhood as a place of resistance. Um, so these were some of the posters that were created by the Print Collective some of them large billboards that stayed up for a while. Um, one of them sort of mockingly um, from some, uh, uh, based on, on cleaners. Come enjoy the mission, cleaner, brighter, whiter tablecloths. Um, and some of it involved kind of taking over uh, uh, the market, taking over billboard, billboards and um, transforming them. So this is in Spanish. Uh, loosely translated as capital screws us over. Um, one of the things that has been a constant frame for politicians is using homelessness as uh, one of the things they run on. So the last two mayors that San Francisco have had have run as, as kind of part of their campaigns, anti-homeless campaigns. So um, over the years, the Print Collective has worked uh, with the um, Coalition on Homelessness, creating posters around homelessness to assert people's dignity and right to exist in the city. Um, one of the things, the way that I got involved with, with the Print Collective was um, first learning how to do silk screens through classes that the Print Collective does, and now as, as a member of the Print Collective, teaching classes um, with activists so that they have their own ability to reshape the urban environment and to um, put up their own words, um, both on the streets, but also um, uh, using those skills then during protests and rallies. This was something that um, an immigrant from a group called St. Peter's Housing Committee who took the class created. This was the first artwork that I think she had ever considered that she had done. Um, and it then became um, placards that were used um, in rallies around uh, raids, ice raids that were happening at the time. Um, one of the things that we also do is take on larger scale stuff like creating murals. So again, um, working on, in a partnership with the Coalition on Homelessness, trying to recast kind of how um, there had been a, that particular month there had been an ongoing series of articles in the SF Chronicle um, basically criminalizing homelessness. Um, and so we wanted to emphasize the dignity of people who uh, don't have affordable housing and are forced to live on the streets. Um, there are the things that the city is shaped not only by its physical presence, but how we use that physical space. So the next little section is some work that I've, I call the City of Radical Festival, that kind of cities were and, and towns traditionally were the places where people from the countryside could come together and celebrate. And I heard somewhere, you know, we have, I don't know, a dozen holidays um, today in, 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 you know, the 1600s, 1500s um, in Western Europe. It seemed like every other or every week there was a usually church-related holiday. There were reasons for people to come together and create culture. Um, so for the last um, six or so years, I've been involved with um, a festival around Day of the Dead in San Francisco, 
um, creating some posters for it, but then also um, creating um, altars for this festival that happens. And um, this is an, an example of a project I did early on that was after um, the September 11th uh, World Trade Center attacks. And it was creating an altar um, commemorating the undocumented workers who had worked at Windows of the World, which was the, the restaurant that was at, at the top, who were folks who um, there was no one in the United States looking for them and their bodies. There were folks back in their homelands in Oaxaca or other places in Mexico and Central America wondering what had happened to their loved ones. Um, and I was able to um, get some photographs from uh, a nonprofit in, in New York who was trying to identify folks. Um, and so back in the Mission District, I tried to create a memorial to that. Um, one of the things around some of these festivals is that they've then become very kind of complicated, oftentimes commercialized. You know, I don't know, Davis has sort of similar things. Cinco de Mayo celebrations, which are really about selling Budweiser, it seems. Um, we've managed to keep this particular festival in the Mission District completely non-commercialized. Um, but it's also become much more complicated because now it's, it was something that was a traditional uh, festival to honor the dead in Mexico and Central America that had its roots in indigenous culture. Um, it was something that was not really celebrated by immigrants, but uh, Chicano artists in the 70s kind of reinvented it as a US thing. Um, and now it's become a very white thing. A lot of folks from outside of the neighborhood come and enjoy that celebration, uh, which is a great thing, but it also means that for a lot of the local folks, it becomes a little weird when all these folks sort of invade the neighborhood wearing skeleton faces. Um, so one of the groups I work with, Poder, does their own little celebration as a way to be able to work with their members who maybe don't want to be part of this thing that is really blown up out of, you know, in, in really cool ways, but out of the intimate kind of setting that really was about celebrating um, a personal experience of the dead. Um, and so we do this at a, a place called the Secret Garden, which was this little um, hidden lot uh, inside of a, of a um, hidden away inside a block that very few people know about. Um, some of the stuff I've been doing more recently, uh, I've been trying to figure out uh, the whole world of arts grants and just doing, entering this kind of um, uh, art uh, um, installations. And so this is a project that a friend of mine, Mabel Negrete, got me involved with, um, and I'm calling this the city of self-knowledge, sort of how liberation comes about in that kind of pedagogical way of creating conversations and learning from each other and remembering our own um, histories as communities. Um, so in a Mission District art space called Cell Space, uh, Mabel created this um, space for conversations about um, the neighborhood. Um, we created a huge map of the Mission District of two of the main streets that have seen the, the largest changes of this kind of in the last 10 years of gentrification, um, which are Mission Street and Valencia Street with you know, a street that, that a lot of the nonprofits that serve very low income folks are based on Valencia Street. Um, but now, except for those nonprofits, the entire street has been turned mostly into upscale boutiques. So, um, a lot of it was getting folks to tell stories about um, the neighborhood. Um, we got some um, old timers who joined us and told stories from the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, one day we created a, a scrapbook, so lots of folks brought in um, pictures and stories. Um, and then one day we had a, an event out in the streets where we gave people uh, a map with questions and asked folks, um, for example, to find a restaurant where um, all the workers in the kitchen are Latino and all the staff at the front are white, and then to find, which was not very difficult to do, um, and then to find a restaurant where the staff at the front were um, 
Latino immigrants. That was a little bit harder to do. Not impossible. Um, but it was sort of, sort of questions that might get people to think about where they live in. Um, this is just, um, I think, one of the things of thinking about cities traditionally or in the third world was that they were really cities that were built um, by self-builders, um, something that is almost impossible um, today. So these are some small projects that I've done um, with some programs. This was with uh, Yes Tomorrow, which was a design build school. So this is actually not in a city. This is out in rural Vermont. We did a bus stop um, working um, almost entirely with students. I think the, the hope was really to do a project with um, the community of folks who would be using this um, school bus stop. A um, little bit harder to, to manage, but I think some fun projects anyways. Um, the main kind of self-building in some ways that happens in cities is community gardens. Those are the places where um, regular folks are able to come out and really transform, oftentimes an abandoned lot. Um, so this was a project I did when I was a, a grad student. Um, uh, we created a, a, um, a tool shed that was actually an undercover composting toilet that we weren't able to get a permit for. Um, so it's really a tool shed. Um, and then these are some projects at, at my current work at Asian Neighborhood Design, uh, which is a community design center in San Francisco. Um, a and uh, provides architecture services for other nonprofits, but we also run a job training program um, that is a, a pre-apprentice program with a carpenters union. So young folks who are trying to get into um, a job with the carpenters union and don't have a lot of uh, background either in, in building trades or just in having a job um, come through the program. And one of the things that we started doing is um, building some sheds um, we have some big ideas about how these sheds might someday be used. Um, and we've been trying to, to market this with um, folks in the neighborhood. Haven't, haven't quite figured out how to make it a success, but that's uh, an ongoing project at a and um, The next section is a little bit about how if early on I showed you some stuff about how folks maybe take over um, walls with posters and murals or take over spaces temporarily in a festival setting, um, this is a little bit more about thinking about how we create actual public spaces that um, can be used and the challenges with that. Um, this was a project that a and developed. The housing that you see in the background is uh, affordable housing. Uh, we were the developers for it. Um, and we created a park that was hopefully going to be um, given over to the city as a public park in this um, little alleyway. Um, we're still the owners of the park, and so um, there's still a gate on it, unfortunately. Um, some of the projects that we do are about um, transforming streets and working with small businesses and neighborhood groups to think about how they can begin to transform streets. So this was a project that we did um, on Divisadero Street in San Francisco and just bringing forth a bunch of ideas about how we could make more public space um, and more spaces that people in the community could take ownership of so that we don't have or we can move beyond. This had been a, a nice neighborhood street at some point in San Francisco's history. In the 50s, it became a major thoroughfare. So there you see the, the lights and the, uh, the median, um, but bringing it back to perhaps creating more of a neighborhood feel. Um, we do a lot of work with small businesses um, on various corridors in San Francisco. Um, these were some projects around um, encouraging the use of streets for public vending. And then the last project in this section um, actually is, is how Michael got me involved in a lot of this stuff. Uh, was working with him on a redesign for um, a uh, public 
uh, plaza at a BART station on 16th Street. Um, after that, uh, BART revisited doing a redesign for the next BART station over. Um, and so these were some drawings of what we thought about in terms of creating opportunities for public art, for plantings, um, and for uses. Uh, the picture on the top left is actually the station that Michael worked on the design for, where a main part of it is, was creating panels for community artists to be able to display their work. Um, some of the activities that happen on the plaza are programmed, um, and that was a, a huge thing to be able to find money to say, hey, we're going to have every Thursday afternoon, we're going to have a hip hop event or some other event on the plaza to create public uses. But other things happen completely randomly, so that, that or not randomly, but not controlled or programmed. Um, so related back to um, some of the, the Day of the Dead stuff, we saw the, the picture on the bottom right, or some artists creating altars out of um, bark and flowers on uh, the 24th Street um, BART Plaza grounds. Um, hopefully the BART police stayed away and didn't tell them to move on um, and things, things worked out. A large part of, of the work that we do at A&D is creating participatory planning processes. And um, I imagine that um, Michael and his classes will probably be delving deep into kind of the, the ways of creating um, participatory processes. And this was a project that, that we just finished with um, a group called the Chinatown Com Community Development Center. Um, working on, similar to, to the project I just showed before, redesign for a new subway station. Um, but interestingly, the, the funds for this came from the transit agency who had kind of forgotten to actually talk to anybody in Chinatown, um, or at least to, to speak to them in uh, Cantonese, um, or to do any workshops where uh, the public, other than the transit geeks, would come to. So basically, they'd held a few workshops. And the, the, what happens is oftentimes there are people like myself who are really interested in this stuff and show up um, who might not live in the neighborhood or might live in the neighborhood but are the ones who are already connected to planning circles. Um, so Chinatown CDC was able to get some funds from them to do a design um, after the transit agency had already been working on their design. So we're not sure how they're going to respond to what the people really want, um, but that's what we did, um, was we held a series of, of workshops um, bringing broad questions about what is it that is needed um, in a station. Um, do you really want a station? Is it in the right place? Um, generally, people were pretty satisfied with where the station was being planned for, um, that it should be there. Um, but they had a lot of concerns about the kind of public space that would happen, the kinds of wanting to have small businesses as part of it, wanting to have cultural references back to Chinatown um, and the Chinese community, and in particular, the history of that neighborhood. Um, and then talking a lot about feng shui, which was something that the um, transit agency hadn't talked about at all. So how a new public space might actually be shaped um, to be surrounded by the new space, um, concerns about daylighting. So these were some sketches that came out of, out of that process. Um, one thing I hinted at there is once we created that design, and it, mostly it was a series of design guidelines. We didn't want to um, piss off the, the transit agency too much by saying exactly what creating a design. Really what people had in mind was a certain set of goals, which were some of them were already incorporated into the transit agency's design. Some of them were definitely not. Uh, but at some point, when CCDC is bringing this back to the transit agency, there's going to be some conflict and some tension. Um, for the last eight years, I've been involved with this group, the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition, um, where 
tension with the city is definitely a, a central point of, of what they're doing. So I call this sec section the city of collective action. Um, those posters I showed at the beginning of, of the slideshow uh, were part of a huge movement that was happening in not just the Mission District, but really the Mission District was kind of the epicenter because that was kind of the hip neighborhood in San Francisco where a lot of not just people were moving to, people with a lot more affluence and money, um, but where a lot of capital was moving to in terms of uh, investment in um, new companies that were displacing the existing small businesses. Um, in terms of buying houses that had been rental houses and turning them into condos, evicting all the tenants, um, and then marketing them for a whole set of different people with a whole set of different values. Um, so these are some pictures from some of the rallies that happened um, in 2000. These are actually, the top one is, is from 2000. The bottom three are actually from last year. And there's Michelle my partner getting arrested at a, uh, a sit-in we did at a site um, that we had for a long time been looking at as a potential affordable housing site. Um, it was a former paint store where a lot of day laborers congregated. We had worked with a group called the, uh, the Day Labor Program around trying to get a permanent site uh, for the day laborers at that site. Um, and there had been some positive conversations with the owner of the site to sell that to an affordable housing developer. Um, unfortunately, somebody else was offering more money. Um, but we were hoping um, to use uh, the city process, the zoning process, to create spaces for affordable housing. Um, the SF Print Collective, the posters I showed at the beginning were posters that were Artists responding to a situation, artists responding to, say, displacement or, say, homelessness. Um, but beyond that, one of the things that the Print Collective was very aware of is what is that question that I posed at the beginning, what is the relationship of a professional, or in this case, an artist, to a community in struggle? And so one of the things that the Print Collective was always very conscious of is that they were not just artists creating posters, but they were artists creating posters um, in relationship to organizations of people in struggle. So um, the Print Collective got involved in electoral campaigns, uh, not really kind of directly in the campaigns, but around kind of those issues that the organizations raised. Um, one of the things that happened through this process was there was a sea change, at least at the Board of Supervisors, and that's our former mayor, Willie Brown, being checked checked at least for a time um, by a new progressive board of supervisors um, that then allowed us to push forward some of the demands that people had around gentrification. Um, one of the things that happens in these struggles is traditionally there might be a struggle that one identifies a particular target. One might say the state is coming in to take over my house and redevelop this area for a new freeway. Or one might say um, there's a uh, Walmart moving in and they're going to tear down the sacred oak tree and so we're going to fight the Walmart on this. Um, but one of the things that happens is that, that these changes happen incrementally, little by little. Um, and a lot of that is set up by the rules that the state creates to support how capitalism moves money around a neighborhood. And so MAC, the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition, identified that set of rules as our target. Um, so we, these were some posters by the Print Collective. They plan for profits, we plan for people. And so one of the things that we started to work on was the people's plan, an alternative plan for the neighborhood created by people in the neighborhood. Um, and there were particular struggles, such as the struggle of this family pictured here, the Ramirez family, who um, owned a flower shop, that um, NIMBY, most, some, basically a white hippie neighbor, 
uh, didn't want their store there. They thought it was a little messy and wanted them out of there. Um, and was using the permit process as a way to, to target this family. And this is how Mac then got involved in the whole idea of planning, zoning, permits as the target for how we might create a neighborhood that really responded to the needs of people who, and so the, the full name for the People's Plan was a People's Plan for Jobs, Housing, and Community. Um, how we could keep local jobs um, and small businesses and small industries that still existed. So, you know, one of the things that happens in industrial neighborhoods like the Mission um, in the 60s and 70s with deindustrialization, a lot of the big canneries and, and big uh, ironworks being shipped off to other countries, those areas become abandoned. Um, but over time, new industries come in. And there is a philosophy among planners to try to find the biggest and best use. One year might be biotech. We're going to take over this whole neighborhood and turn it into biotech. Um, so in the Mission District in the early 90s, that was the thing. They were trying to turn it into biotech. In the late 90s, it was dot coms. Um, I don't know what it'll be now. It'll, um, but in the meantime, a lot of small businesses move in. Um, garment Industries, I'm not wearing my, I usually use my, my Timbuktu bag, because um, they were an example of a business that kind of, uh, you know, they make bags and it, um, I think they were, they were started in the early 70s, but they really took off in the 80s and 90s. And that's what these spaces were for, and those spaces employed a lot of uh, local folks. Um, but now, because of zoning, that, um, zoning loopholes that allowed housing, those spaces were being threatened. So the city as a place of liberation then becomes a place where we actually have to organize and plan for change. And so these are some, some pictures of, of Max organizing meetings, trying to set up goals, um, and then trying to create um, an alternative plan. So this is the people's plan um, at Asian Neighborhood Design. We provided technical assistance for that, kind of pouring through EIRs and pouring through the, huge, the city's general plan um, and trying to figure out where both limitations of use would be, but also how to create those regulations that might really give us the public benefits that we wanted out of development. Uh, the idea wasn't necessarily to stop development, but to say, if you developers, you capital finance are coming into this neighborhood, what are you giving to the people that are in this neighborhood? Um, and so that was always central to how we approached planning in the neighborhood. So the last section I'm going to end with is the city of collective ownership. Ultimately, um, the examples that we've talked about are some of them operate on a cultural level, some of them operate on a uh, regulatory level, but ultimately one of the things that people want is we want to know that we belong here. And one of the ways that we belong here is that we own this place. Um, so we're in, in the midst of these discussions around displacement and gentrification, um, the idea of a community land trust kept being brought up. And I don't know, how many of you are familiar with community land trusts? Anybody? So community land trust is an interesting example of ownership where uh, ultimately it's, or, or in its beginnings, it's, it's, it's got various roots, but partly, uh, Gandhi in India, in, in sort of back to the land movement, had uh, a whole uh, theory around how land should be owned at a time when capitalism was transforming India in the early part of the 20th century. Land, village land was being uh, sold off to investors and being turned into large farms. Um, and so there was an idea that perhaps the village ought to be able to control land, but people ought to have the ability to farm their own land. And there was a relationship there between the individual and the community. Um, so community land trusts are, in the United States, have existed for about 30 years, 30 or 40 years. Um, they mostly exist in small towns where individual single-family homes maybe are built but the land underneath those homes are owned by a community land trust. And the community land trust has a lease with that 
homeowner that sets some limits to what can be done with that land. Perhaps what the community wants is permanent affordability. You shouldn't be able to speculate on this, you know, sell it to anybody, but really we want housing that is affordable to, net, or to future generations. Um, there are land trusts for um, public space um, and other kinds, but a community land trust is usually around housing. So um, in 2001, 2002, um, I got involved with um, some folks who were really interested in this idea. We met with the city. They told us we were crazy. There were too many nonprofits building housing. They, al they already had kind of the, the turf staked out. They already had all the funding. We said, well, nobody is really dealing with small 20-unit buildings. The nonprofit developers in San Francisco, because of how financing works, have to do huge projects. Um, so it took us a lot of Saturday morning meetings at coffee shops, hashing out bylaws, um, uh, figuring out uh, how to create a democratic process to create this thing. Uh, we finally got incorporated, I think, 2003, 2004. And just around that time, there was a struggle happening in this building that, uh, in Chinatown that our local community college had bought. Um, and they, they had, for a long time, been wanting to build a campus in Chinatown to uh, educate uh, young people in Chinatown. So they bought a building, and they were going to evict the parents of the people that they wanted to educate, um, 20 Chinese immigrant families, in order to create this campus. Um, the folks who lived there fought back. They're all immigrants. Um, they didn't necessarily want to save their building. They wanted to be able to stay in Chinatown with access to the services that they've always had, with access um, to the Chinese hospital. Um, they worked out a deal with City College. City College later reneged on the deal. They went back to fighting. Eventually, City College said, OK, OK, fine. We'll build on the parking lot next door, which they should have done in the first place. Now we're going to sell the building to another slumlord. And the tenants thought about, well, is there a possibility that we could buy this building? Um, so the Community Land Trust worked with those tenants to buy this building. It's the first Community Land Trust building in San Francisco. So it'll be a building that is owned by the tenants as a limited equity housing cooperative. Um, and through the lease agreement with the Community Land Trust, will be permanently affordable for all generations to come, meaning that whatever the income levels of the folks who are living there, that's who they can sell that building to. They can gain equity. They can pass that equity on to their children. But that building will not be something that gets speculated on the open market um, to any investor. So that's, I think, my range of all sorts of crazy things that I've been involved in that I tried to pull together under this heading of liberatory urbanism. Um, I wanted to finish with, this is where I was going to put my cheesy slide of, of our son uh, and say this is all for the future generations, but skip that part. So I found this because uh, he's here. So um, This is something that I learned from a mentor of mine, Stephen Goldsmith, um, a saying from South Africa that's been used in New Orleans by the People's Hurricane Relief Fund, nothing about us without us is for us. And I think that maybe one of the threads in what I've been showing you is that these are all projects that I've been working on, but hopefully they have been with um, partners and coalitions and the people who we work with. And so I think I just want to end with that. So thank you. Great presentation. I, one of the themes that I've sort of uh, that's clear in, in the work is that the city is not this singular thing, the singular object. When we think of cities, we think of one place with a particular identity. Uh, your, your work shows us that there are multiple San Franciscos uh, that are there that you know cross cultural, physical, social, you know, political, etc. So that's an important lesson to think about as many of you will begin to do work in, in communities, whether they're large cities like San Francisco or a small Central Valley town, there's, there's, there's multiplicity in these communities that we as designers and planners have to think about when we sort of begin to engage in, in work. 
so hopefully I've stalled enough that some of you can think of some questions to ask Fernando. Um, not at, at, at that location. The, the project that actually that, that Michael had, had worked on, um, the other transit station, um, one of the things we incorpor incorporated in um, were um, having access to utilities so that when someone was setting up, they could plug into those utilities. Um, that, I think that photograph was from the other station that hasn't been uh, redesigned yet, but, um, but that's one of the things. Um, and then that gets you into a whole world of then who's managing access to those utilities and how do you program that, but um, yeah. <laughs> Didn't do anything in terms of either uh, barriers or uh, shells? That would no. Work. One of the things um, on, on that, we tried to create a, um, a uh, 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 what am I, theater, what do you call a theater? Of, uh, Stage, yeah, we tried to create a stage. Um, there wasn't enough space to create a fully accessible stage. Um, so what we ended up doing was seating steps that could be used as stages um, at, at the uh, 24th Street one, our design was meant so that the stage was actually just one ramp that went around that and actually someone with a wheelchair could get up and around. Um, but yeah, we had to sort of balance that that question. Yeah. How do you actually get a high level of participation from these different ethnic groups in different neighborhoods? Do you find that you have to find a leader within a local community who then rally support because he or she already has their trust? How do you actually get people showing up? So, one of the things that I, sh I showed, both, both of the ex examples, the Mission Anti Displacement Coalition and then the, the transit work with, with Chinatown CDC. Um, both of those are organizations that have been rooted in that community for a very long time. Uh, MAC is a, is a relatively young coalition, but their member organizations have been around for 30 and 40 years, some of them. Well, not 40, 30 years, some of them 10 or 15. Um, so they have been doing work in the community for a really long time. One of the challenges that, that happens, so MAC really pushed to create this rezoning of San Francisco. The city then started to say, hey, we've got to deal with all these developers, and this industrial land has really had the same zoning for the last 50 years. We really need to deal with this. Um, so they started to do their workshops, and it was a bunch of college students who showed up. It was a bunch of people who were already planners who showed up, and then some of Mac's leaders would show up. And so Mac kind of took over a couple of their workshops. Um, and so we did our own pre-workshops with our members um, around what the issues were because there was a lot of training that had to happen. Um, we provided translation for the city. Um, that happened early on. I think the city caught on to the fact that we were taking over their process and kind of pushed us back out again. Um, but it sort of set the stage for some of that. I think one of the, the problems that happens is, you know, a city uh, it tries to do a, a kind of uh, neutral process. Um, but in the middle of these struggles, there is no neutral. And being neutral um, and not uh, say, well, English is the universal language, so we're going to do a project in English. And um, it ends up being, no, it, that really privileges certain people over others. So it's, it's a constant struggle that really the community organizations have to be there to be pushing back on that. Um, and, and in that particular case, it, we had a couple of friendly kind of junior level staff who really helped us get our foot in, in the door there, um, despite the director of city planning. So it always allies are important to have. So yeah. fighting, but finding allies yeah. that, are, that might appear to be the opposite, yeah. the opposite side. One more question, then we'll wrap it up. So 
It's, it's, it's tough, and I don't think that we've ever um, managed to do it, you know, get everybody. Um, so for example, you know, one of the things that, that the Print Collective created for Mac was we took over this, this uh, I don't know if you all know who Posada is, he was a famous Mexican printmaker. Um, so a little uh, Day of the Dead guy who's holding a house as, as Mac's symbol. Um, everybody who, we, who the Print Collective from, had met with from Mac really liked that idea, that became the symbol. Um, so in, it happened to be that it was mostly Chicanos and, and Mexican immigrants who had been at those meetings. So some Salvadoreños came to the next meeting and they said, why, is it, why are there these dead people as this, our symbol for our struggle? That's a little weird because it wasn't resonating culturally with sort of an image that was really important to them and, and their struggle. It's, it's, those things, yeah, they're going to happen all the time. You know, language, we work, I think, there's a whole history there of organizing in the Mission District where actually Mac um, had a lot of tension with a lot of the old timers. The old timers in the neighborhood um, had come up as part of a Chicano movement in the 60s and 70s. Uh, we were working with a lot of newer immigrants, um, people who, for whom Spanish was a first language. We probably missed a lot of immigrants who were from Oaxaca or from the Yucatan, who, for whom Spanish is actually a second language, who spoke indigenous languages as, as their first language. So yeah, it's a constant struggle around that. Well, let's thank Fernando again for a great lecture. <laughs>